and thank you all so much for coming on this wintry day. Let's see if we can heat it up with some cool info about animals. Um, so thanks for taking time out of your day today to come. Um, special shout out to all the classrooms that are tuning in. Yeah, science rocks. And it's so good to have you all along. And for everybody else, may we all stay young at heart. So um, we're going to uh, talk today about uh, terrestrial animals. And I have a, a lot of fun stories to share. But of course, I can't tell all the stories because there's so many. So I'm going to offer a selection today. And if you have any questions about what I dip into or things that I didn't get to, feel free to ask me about it uh, or send me an email follow up after. And like Suzanne mentioned, I'm going to give the next installment uh, focusing on aquatic animals uh, in two weeks time. So more info on that to come. Uh, like Suzanne mentioned, uh, I'm tuning in today from uh, the, the tundra of Hancock, New Hampshire, which is where uh, the Harris Center for Conservation Education is based. Uh, uh, we're an interesting organization. I think a mission is very similar to the Wells Reserve, so that's why it's such a pleasure to be here among similarly minded people. And I saw some uh, Harris Center names. So thanks for uh, having this great kind of group come together. Um, you can check out the Harris Center website if you want to hear about more about what we do. And we also offer online events that are often free and open to the public. And if you're ever in our area, we also have a lot of trails and outdoor opportunities. Um, and we uh, protect uh, are involved in protecting over 24,000 acres of uh, land in the southwest region of New Hampshire. So that's just a bit about my background. So I, I, I've been a lifelong animal lover. My family definitely instilled that in me. And I already can tell that there's some animal lovers in the audience. I think I saw a kitty cat and I know I saw a cockatoo out there. So, um, so uh, our pets are lucky to live indoors, right? Today we're going to talk about how critters cope with punishing cold in the outdoors. And, you know, overall, we could sort of sum up and say, that the mix of strategies involves, uh, you know, an, often a combination of these. But if we wanted to sort of make a list, we would say migration, hibernation, and persistence. So we're not going to spend too much time on migration today. Those are uh, animals that would generally uh, like to avoid winter. Um, we're going to focus more on hibernation, uh, which can uh, take a lot of different forms. We'll talk a bit about uh, brumation, which is how uh, cold-blooded animals uh, suspend their or, or reduce their metabolism for periods. Um, and then homeotherms, warm-blooded animals, typically engage in uh, a mixture of, of, of metabolic reducing strategies and then bursts of activity. And that's why, you know, hibernation is, you know, maybe a better word for it is this kind of weird word here, torpor, which is these sort of short uh, or, and sometimes prolonged periods of, of reduced metabolism and body temperature that are uh, interrupted by periods of activity. So we'll talk about that in a bit. And then also some of the most interesting examples I think are the organisms that persist and uh, either stay active all winter or engage in periods of dormancy, which often involves uh, freeze tolerance mechanisms or freeze avoidance mechanisms, many of which are you know, the products of long evolutionary histories, a combination of, of physiological and behavioral uh, strategies to survive, conditions that would, of course, you know, kill most human beings if we attempted to survive in these conditions without a lot of our modern advancements. So a quick tip of the hat to migration, because it's cool. And it's not just about the birds. Of course, birds are amazing migrators. But increasingly, scientists are learning more about insects and how they migrate to avoid winter. And two of the most common local examples 
Uh, what probably if I had to pick my favorite bug, the monarch butterfly uh, that migrates uh, more than a thousand miles here in the northeast part of uh, North America. I know there's someone turning in from California. California monarchs also engage in a really interesting uh, Western migratory pattern. And then uh, green darner dragonflies are another amazing insect that also engages on a, a seasonal migration. So these are organisms like some of our birds that would uh, don't have some of these survival strategies to persist or, or uh, resist winter in place so they avoid winter. And then of course, like I mentioned earlier, there's fuzzy boundaries. There's a lot of examples of animals that migrate in order to hibernate. And two of the best examples are snakes and bats. Snakes, um, most of our snakes locally are, are fairly solitary. They don't congregate in large groups often throughout uh, the spring and summer, but in winter time, uh, it becomes quite a different situation as many of our snakes uh, travel sometimes fairly long distance in order to congregate in rock crevices that are uh, prone to, you know, produce good thermal regulation conditions. And they will sort of congregate in masses of sometimes tens of thousands of snakes. And of course, there's big advantages of congregating in groups when it comes to retaining body heat. So of course, these are cold-blooded organisms that can tolerate quite low temperatures, but they don't have a lot of freeze tolerance mechanisms. So it's really important for these organisms to find hibernacula, which are, or hibernaculum, it's singular, places where they can find these conditions in order to successfully overwinter. Bats are another really interesting example of short distance migrators in order to find optimal hibernacula. Uh, I don't know as much about bats in Maine, but bats in New Hampshire are really restricted in the number of caves and abandoned mines that they choose to seek out for these overwintering refuges. Most of the bats here in southwestern New Hampshire actually migrate to southern Vermont. And that's where they can find some of these optimal cave environments in, in which to overwinter. So um, I've tried to always give photo credits. Some, a, a lot of these photos were taken by Harris Center supporters, and some of them are from sort of partnering agencies or photos that have been submitted. So I've tried to give photo credits throughout. Um, and I try to pick photos that are Inter, uh, you know, interesting and sort of demonstrative in some way. And this little brown bat on the left is, is just amazing uh, at the way it's sort of, you know, suspended and how it's sort of tucking in its little wings there. So um, really amazing. And they don't sleep the entire time they're in the cave. They sort of suppress their metabolism, suppress their temperature, but they're relatively small. So studies have shown that if bats don't wake themselves up about every two to three weeks throughout the winter they won't survive so they actually engage of these periods of metabolic rise for a short period often just a day or two and then they will sort of uh, shut their metabolism down again so it's this interesting sort of priming the pump so that when spring comes they actually are able to sort of resuscitate themselves but they can't do that too much because otherwise they don't have sufficient resource stores within their body to survive that sort of pulse back and forth so a lot of things that we talk about today you might think about sort of the looming implications of a changing climate and how that could affect these organisms uh, they're very much susceptible to a lot of those changes. Snowpack amounts, length of winter, of course, average winter temperatures. Uh, there, there's many implications that would come with uh, the, the, the shortening and alleviation of wintertime stress that we see. That might not necessarily all be a good thing to organisms that are highly evolved and adapted to places that experience 
sufficient and prolonged periods of cold. Okay, so uh, now we'll talk a bit about bears because they're, they're awesome and um, they're captivating for all sorts of different re reasons. And um, they are really uh, great ex ways of demonstrating some of these sort of trends that we see in, in animals and how animals uh, survive winter. So bears are sort of famous for being hibernators, but again, hibernation is relative. They do reduce their metabolism and thereby it reduces their body temperature. And that allows the fat stores that they've built up to sustain them throughout the winter. Uh, but just like the bats, the bears also have periods within their uh, hibernacula dens that they actually sort of uh, become a, uh, awakened a bit, sort of groggy and a bit uh, aroused from their slumber. And then they often will sort of sink back into that. And one of the things that's happening during that is uh, so, so that priming of the pump that we talked about earlier, but also so that the bears can sort of sense the surrounding temperature and therefore get a sense of the, the clock, right? And then of course, another thing that bears are famous for doing during hibernation is having babies. So during hibernation is when uh, pregnant female bears will have their cubs, give birth to their cubs, and the cubs will actually nurse uh, in the, the, the hibernacula while mom is sort of half asleep. So those of us that have, have uh, you know, been a similar mammalian situation, you might ask yourself if that's really hibernating, right? So it's kind of amazing that uh, for, for a, a period of, of an organism's life that's considered, you know, inactive, one of the most profound parts of their life cycle is taking place. And another interesting corollary to human family situations is the cubs do not hibernate. <laughs> Uh, they are active, they, are, they have a food source there in their mom, the, in the milk that she provides for them. So they do not need to adjust their metabolism. Um, so they are sort of remaining active while, while mom is in a sort of a, a slightly different state of mind and state of body. So very interesting. Another, uh, useful thing about bears is that they're very handy for demonstrating one of these trends that we see in ecology so one thing that ecologists like myself try to do is we try to understand patterns that we see in nature and then develop tools to describe those patterns so uh one thing that a lot of uh humans like to do is ask questions and uh, yet another habit that a lot of humans have is we like to develop rules to describe nature because it makes us feel like we have a handle on what's happening. And of course, just like any rule, there's exceptions. So that's why on the slides that I have these sort of rules, they're in quotation marks because they're fuzzy rules. There's lots of exceptions, but there are a lot of examples of taxa that sort of bear them out, bad pun perhaps, okay? Um, so one question you might ask is, you know, is it, what, what size is advantageous for, for animals that live in cold climates? Is it better to be bigger or is it better to be smaller? Well, one trend we see is we study mammals uh, on a, uh, you know, biogeographical basis. So thinking about mammals that live at lower latitude, close to the equator, and compared to organisms that live at mid-latitude, like where we live and like where many of us are right now, and then organisms that live at high latitude. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, you're headed towards the Arctic Circle there. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, as you increase in latitude, you, of course, approach Antarctica and the South Pole. So um, one trend that, uh, is shown in a lot of different animal groups is that colder places tend to have larger examples of given types of organisms. So if you think about bears, in, in our neck of the woods, we have black bear, which are by no means a small organism, but they're far smaller than their 
more northerly cousins, grizzlies and polar bears. So one reason for that is that larger organisms have a smaller surface area to volume ratio because they're big and their volume is huge uh, that this overall ratio of comparing the surface area to that volume is decreased at higher body sizes that leads to more efficiency in body heat regulation larger bodied organisms can will retain heat longer and uh, dissipate heat slower than smaller bodied organisms. So you can probably, if, if you are thinking about other animals that you know, where you can think of that they have cousins that live in different places, many organisms bear out this trend, including the deers, right? The cervidae family, um, one of, you know, the most common large animals in the woods out where I am here is white-tailed deer. And then uh, far less common in our woods these days because of many different reasons are moose. Um, moose populations, I'm sure as you may or know, are, are suffering from a lot of different influences. Um, but in general, this is another group of animals that shows, bears out this Bergman's rule that larger animals perform more optimally in colder places. This is a small moose, but this is just such a, uh, a nice young individual. Both of these are young individuals of their respective species, but even at this young age, they show this difference in body size that provides a lot of advantages for the larger organisms in colder places. All right, another uh, one that you could think about, you know, biogeographical trends and thinking about animals that live in different places is coloration. Again, there are plenty of exceptions to the rule, but this uh, individual a researcher, Gloger, you know, postulated and did a, little, a lot of research on pigmentation in animals. And one trend we can see is that Many organisms that live in persistently cold places or that experience seasonally cold temperatures are white or turn white. And uh, this seems perhaps a bit counterintuitive and this it's always interesting to me to follow those sort of counterintuitive trends in nature. Anybody who's gone out in the summer sun in a black t-shirt, I think, would perhaps think that it might be a good thing to be darker colored in a cold, split, cold spot so that you would absorb lots of solar radiation. But uh, one interesting thing is that the pigment, which is predominantly composed of a material called melanin, the pigment that turns organisms feathers or fur darker actually takes up space within their feather barbules or within their hair shafts. So if you're a snowy owl or a polar bear, instead of having the melanin in your feather shaft or in your hair, it's empty or relatively empty. And that absent space, that empty space gets filled with air. And that essentially means that each hair and each feather acts as an increasingly efficient insulator. A white hair has far more higher insulative value than a black hair because of those air spaces that can re uh, help insulate the individual. Um, of course, there's other selective pressures. Right. In addition to thinking about insulation, organisms have to think about uh, camouflage. And that's another selective pressure that can influence coat coloration. And especially in mid latitude places, there's many examples of organisms that engage in uh, a, a coat change. Uh, uh, they 
sort of engage in a, you know, a, a really big change in morphology. Um, and that's often provides not only the insulation advantage, but also the camouflage advantage. So there's a lots of evolutionary trade-offs at play that organisms sort of have to, um, over evolutionary time, populations engage in this winnowing of traits that uh, redu reduces what we see in the population to some of the traits that provide these great advantages. So this is a, a long-tailed weasel that's sort of in mid-molt in April. So in this time of year, this organism would be going from white to brown. So sort of, uh, they often molt like this where they go from top to bottom. Um, where in the winter time, this is a, a related species, not the exact same species. This is the uh, short-tailed weasel in full winter coloration. So this organism, um, they're one of my favorites. They're extremely adept hunter. So here it's uh, about to feast on a subnivian organism that we'll talk in, about in a bit, a vole that's been remaining winter active underneath the snowpack. In addition to the insulative value here for this uh, stoat, the white fur is also providing a camouflage advantage for them to sneak into the burrow of the vole. And then you might ask yourself, why isn't the vole white? If being white's so great, then why isn't everything white in the winter? Right? Well, a vole has other ways of insulating itself. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And a vole, uh, given where it lives, um, they often want to, you know, keep some of those dark pigmentation in order to be able to hide in some of the darker spaces under the snowpack that they reside in the wintertime. So lots of different uh, selective pressures that sort of shape the organisms that we see in our woods. All right, so um, this is where, you know, Suzanne said I would sort of take a pause in the, in the middle here. So kind of, um been going for a little over 20 minutes or so this is a good time if you are, have thought of any questions that you want to put in the chat um or if there's anything burning that you, anybody wants to talk about now um i'll definitely leave time at the end here uh but this is uh one of the the symbol of the harris center that's in a lot of our logos is the bobcat which is an awesome winter active predator and these are some great shots of uh, a bobcat sort of behaving much like a house cat in some ways sort of stretching and um trying to get itself limber to kind of continue on on a cold day so large predators really need you know large areas of connected land so that's why it's great uh, so many of you are here that are sort of conservation minded. Um, not only bobcats need room to roam, many other winter active mammals do as well in order to meet their uh, food consumption needs and shelter needs that they uh, have to seek out in order to survive extreme winter conditions. So definitely an awesome animal and one that's um at least in our neck of the woods is the po bobcat populations are surging at the moment uh doing quite well often in response to lots of feral rabbits which is one of their favorite prey items so there's a really strong kind of core, you know, relationship between, you know, winter active predators and the winter active prey animals. And of course, winter active prey uh, predators will also eat uh, organisms that are engaging in hibernation. So, you know, organisms like chipmunks that are sort of more sort of, you know, engaging in hibernation if it, if it, Weasel finds one of those winter anesthetized chipmunks. They'll happily become, uh, you know, a sleeping biscuit. Uh, and then other times there's, you know, more active 
you know, predator and prey chases and sort of very active, you know, uh, engagement, like much like we see at other times of the year. So, you know, classical example of that is like the lynx in the hair, right? This is the one of the oldest uh, graphs in ecology. And if you see here on this graph, we have data going back to the 19th century. And it's interesting, you know, to think about how, how that is, why that is. And it's because of fur trapping. So one of the earliest data sets in ecology actually originates from fur trappers and the, the keeping track of the pelts that they would harvest from the woods and then making inferences about population levels based on their ability to harvest snowshoe hare and lynx pelts from uh, wildlands. So, uh, of course, there's protections on uh, lynx, especially. Uh, so some of the, the human harvesting has changed, but I always like to mention that uh, because it's a graph that's really widely shown because it shows sort of the classic predator and prey oscillations, right, of how there's these, you know, interconnectedness, right, that they influence each other. And there's, uh, of course, lots more to the story here. One of the key players that isn't shown in the graph is the plants because hares are another winter active mammal. They have to keep foraging all winter. And they, uh, in the winter time, are really, um, you know, seeking out twigs that are kind of above the snow layer and then stripping off the cambium and the fresher bark from those twigs. So if you uh, ever do, you know, snowshoeing or some sort of winter activities, and you're uh, seeing some tracks that look like these on the bottom, uh, you also might look for evidence of, you know, hair browse in that area. They have to eat quite a bit in order to uh, keep themselves going throughout these really chilly periods. And then, of course, um, some herbivores, uh, you know, generally prey organisms for a lot of our higher trophic level organisms, if they're not, you know, uh, hibernating, they get by often by, via hoarding, hoarding herbivores. And uh, that takes kind of two main forms, scatter hoarding, which is when things, uh, food caches are stored in a very wide array. So gray squirrels are probably the world's best example of this, uh, gray squirrels, store thousands of acorns each fall in pre preparation for the oncoming winter. And they only dig up at best, maybe 10% of those. So, and they steal each other's acorns. There's all these interesting acorn dynamics that are impactful for the squirrels, but also impactful for the oak trees that produce the acorns. Uh, but a, a really nice example that uh, of um, you know one of the most fun animals to watch in the winter out, outside our windows is sort of the squirrels. They're so busy, and they're always up to something. And most of what they're up to right now is trying to find that nut that they hid in September. And they have surprisingly great memories for that. Um, a lot of times it looks like they're sniffing them out, but they're actually doing most of it with their brain and just a little bit with the nose. And then the other main type of herbivore hoarder is what we call larder hoarder. So larder for those folks out there, um, maybe if you've ever heard from Mary Poppins, right? A larder is sort of like a pantry in British speak, right? So this sort of pantry hoarders, right? Where they're all hoarding their stuff all in one spot. And it's often close to where they sleep at night, right? So if you've ever seen a rock wall crevice that has thousands of acorns pouring out, you've probably found a, a larder hoarder stash, right? So there's, um, many examples of this but mice are really classical examples of this and if you've ever had a mouse in your house maybe they have made 
uh, a larder hoard in a boot or something like this. I had this happen not long ago where I went to put on a boot at home and I happened upon uh, the larder hoard stash of one of these winter active herbivores. So uh, that that's how a lot of these winter active animals have to do it. They actually aren't large enough. They're small. They don't have this advantageous large bodied status. So they have to keep eating all winter in order to keep their uh, metabolic rate relatively stable. Um, so here are some more of these sort of examples of smaller animals that are often engaging in, in these sort of hoarding activities. Uh, many of these live in what we call the subnivian zone, which is the zone below the, the snow. They literally live in the snowpack. And they're really important parts of their ecosystems because they support the food web throughout the wintertime. So this is sort of a, a shrew po poking out. You can probably see some evidence of his little cache there, uh, voles and mice other examples of these and these organisms they don't have to invest too much in other insulative strategies because nature does it for them snow is an incredibly efficient <coughs> excuse me insulator and therefore this presence of snow cover is really critical for the survival of these subnivian organisms and many winter active mammals So you can see on this graph how close to the surface, the snowpack temperature is close to the frigid air temperature, but the deeper in the snowpack you go, the warmer it gets. And actually at the bottom of that snowpack, you get it uh, often an ambient temperature that's not below freezing. So they have a fairly well insulated environment so they tunnel through the snow <coughs> excuse me they use a variety of strategies to make their snow homes <coughs> sorry i'm gonna mute while i Sorry about that. Got a little tickle in there. All right, birds. I'm actually watching some chickadees, blue jays, uh, red-bellied woodpeckers right outside the window right now. The Harris Center bird feeder is right behind me. And we put the bird feeder out right now because the bears are at least halfway sleeping. So we feed the birds right now. And if wherever you are, you could safely be feeding your birds, most likely. Um, birds are amazing in their ability to survive winter because of how small they are. They have a, a very high surface area to volume ratio. They lose heat really, really fast. So how do they do it? They have to eat a lot. So that's why it's it's important that they find healthy food sources throughout the winter to support their metabolism. They also grow more feathers. They increase their feather density as winter approaches. And they also shiver like crazy. If you've ever watched birds, they're fluttering their feathers and that's actually generating body heat, much like humans do. But they do it, actually, uh, it's not a sign of stress. It's actually how they get through periods of cold. <laughs> so if you see a bird shivering, they're not sick, they're not suffering. That's actually shivering thermogenesis. It's how they're supporting their um, relatively constant body heat. Some birds do engage in nighttime torpor where they really suppress their body temperature but a lot of them just shiver all night long, wait till morning comes and then forage really rapidly in order to uh, support their metabolism. 
Other interesting thing that they have to do is they have to uh, get by with their feet, right? The feet are a real predicament for birds in the wintertime. And um, some bird people say that if birds could jettison their feet in winter, they might be better off. But of course they can't, right? The feet are not covered with feathers, so they're not well insulated. So they have to engage, they develop over time anatomy that's called countercurrent heat exchange. And that's actually where the blood from their heart is actually pre-cooled as it enters their feet. And the feet that's returning to their heart via the veins is actually pre-warmed by that warmed arterial blood before it returns to the heart. So they do these really interesting physiological mechanisms in order to uh, more efficiently maintain their overall body temperature by reducing heat loss in their feet, uh, which are some of the areas that are most prone to uh, heat dissipation. So uh, I bet I get some people in the audience that like dinosaurs and the cool thing about dinosaurs or there's many cool things, but one of the coolest things is that dinosaurs are still among us, right? Birds are dinosaurs. The dinosaurs didn't really go extinct. The dinosaurs just evolved feathers and learn how to fly. So the more time you spend around birds, watching birds, you really realize that they are reptiles with feathers and they're amazing. And they're, we're so lucky to live in a world with so many birds. So birds, there's, we could be here all day just telling stories about birds. A bird on the right, American robin, a really interesting species, a bird we all see in, in, uh, in our everyday lives, engaging in really interesting shifts with the changing climate. Some robin populations do not migrate anymore. Some still do. So we see this really interesting sort of uh, speciation potentially happening sort of in, in action right now. So lots of really interesting things happening, even with what we would call our everyday birds. Okay, so I got a, just a couple more things I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about bugs. I don't want to tell you about worms. I want to tell you about frogs. Okay. This bug on the left is the woolly bear caterpillar. And I love them. And hopefully some there's a woolly bear lover out there. And maybe you've never seen a woolly bear from below. But that's what you're seeing here. You're actually looking at a woolly bear ventral side. Usually see it from the dorsal side, from the back. But here are the woolly bear's belly. And here are the actual feet. And then these are what we call the pro legs. They're pretty much like caterpillar suction cups. If you've ever tried to pull a caterpillar off of a branch or off of uh, uh, where it's crawling, these back legs really have this uh, retention to the surface. And I just think that it's just amazing. Their caterpillars are just so fun. Um, but a lot of bugs, well, bugs, there's so many bugs, it's hard to generalize. But well, one thing that bugs are really good at doing as winter comes is they engage in what we call super cooling. All right. I mean, how could it not be awesome? It's called super cooling, right? So this is where bugs basically jettison water. When water freezes, it forms ice. Ice is the death knell of a lot of tissues. So organisms have to do lots of savvy things in order to prevent ice nucleation within their tissues. If ice nucleation happens with their, within their tissues, most organisms will die. So insects, what they do generally often is they purge their body water and then they are able to acclimate to cooler and cooler and cooler temperatures, often to like negative 20, negative 30 Celsius. So uh, pretty much the only thing that can kill them when they're in this super cooled state is if they get wet, then they'll, the ice will form and they'll die. So 
if you see a bug that seems to be in sort of like a mummified state in the winter time, it might not be dead. It might just be in this super cooled state of sort of suspended life. Uh, leave it where it is. It, you know, you might, if anything, introduce one of these ice crystallizations that could affect that organism. So if you happen to find a caterpillar or a, a, a chrysalis or even an adult insect, um, leave them be, especially during the winter, because they, they might be actually doing some really cool stuff on a molecular level that's helping them be able to literally spring back to life when spring comes. I don't know that much about this in bugs, but I know a lot about this in worms. So when I was in graduate school, I went to Antarctica and I went there with the objective of studying the adaptations of animals that live in the coldest, driest place on our planet, which is the Antarctic Dry Valley. So this is me in, in one of these places. There is no plants, there's no insects. Uh, the top of the food chain in this environment is a microscopic worm. And this is what that worm's head looks like. It's a bacterial feeding organism that you couldn't even see without a microscope. They're out there. <laughs> uh, and then there's also uh, a group of cool organisms that you might have heard about called tardigrades or water bears. And then there's some other organisms there, like rotifers, but a very short, low diversity food web. And these organisms, how they survive in this extremely cold terrestrial environment is they freeze dry themselves. Much like those insects talked, we talked about, they purge their body water, but then they also produce protective molecules that effectively act as antifreeze and prevent the remaining tissues from fully freezing. Because like we mentioned earlier, that ice formation would be lethal. So coping with water stress and coping with temperature stress, there's a lot of interrelationships there. And a great local example, my last topic of the day is uh, frozen frogs. Uh, a few of our local frog species are actually capable of freezing solid because they actually produce freeze protectant molecules that prevent the ice crystals from actually forming within their body. Uh, wood frogs are the most well studied for this. That's what you're seeing in these pictures here. Uh, they're a small frog about this big, um, fairly common in upland forests. They're really, really common for engaging in this sort of freeze tolerance. They overwinter in the leaf litter, so they don't have the advantage of the snowpack insulation. Um, if you picked up this frog when it's in this state on the, on the right, it would feel like a hard, solid rock. Uh, but when the temperatures rise above freezing consistently, that same frog will reanimate over a period of a couple hours and actually hop away. So in, in the wood frogs and many of the other frogs case, um, peepers can do this as well up to two thirds of the body mass can freeze and they produce these super high concentrations of glucose, which is just a, a sugar molecule. And when the sugar is packed into the body's uh, fluids and tissues, it uh, prevents those tissues from fully freezing. So it's one of uh, a, a amazing event that's gonna happen in a few months when they thaw out and go about their merry frog ways. Um, one of the big projects we do here at the Harris Center is, is uh, counting and assisting frogs and salamanders in their springtime migration, following their overwintering as they approach their uh, vernal pools and other breeding areas. So it's uh, always fascinating and captivating for me to think about the organisms that are, are like, lying in wait, biding their time and waiting for the con right conditions to arrive in order to reassert their life. Well, the, I got to the end of what I had prepared. 
thanks so much for joining me. And a, a quick plug for the next installment that will happen uh, two weeks from now, you can register at Wells Reserve. And for that one, I'm gonna focus on aquatic systems. So if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks so much, Karen. We do have a bunch of questions in the, in the chat. Um, some from the pause where you were showing the bobcat photos. The first one is how old can a bobcat get? Oh, well, you know, average, oh gosh. So it's hard, like how old can they get? is a harder question for me to answer than to say like how old are they on average i would say you know um average bobcat lifespans probably seven to eight years so not incredibly long um and that is you know probably double a lot of uh herbivores so the average lifespan of like while we're talking lifespans like of a deer is typically about four years and a rabbit typically about two so there there's a lot of factors but generally predators live a little bit longer than herbivores uh but then they they also um are are affected by pollution higher trophic levels have uh, accumulation of pollutants so these days some of those dynamics are changing but that's what i would say is an, a good average baseline all right let's see um from a third grader do the colors of their fur change depending on the season and how do snakes migrate uh, well some some animals change fur seasonally and others can't so um you know snowshoe hairs are an example of a of an organism that totally changes its color but interesting like eastern cottontail rabbits another rabbit species they don't change their coat color dramatically um so an organism is sort of like they either have that capability or they don't and even if it would be advantageous for them if they don't have those genes they 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 won't have that trait so um it's always important to remember that <clears throat> you know nobody's perfect nothing's really optimally truly optimally suited for their environment because all of nature and all of us are truly works in progress right um how do snakes migrate they slither um sometimes long distances probably you know not longer usually than a, a few miles uh but there are examples of of snakes engaging in multiple mile uh migrations in order to reach a preferred overwintering crevice um and one thing we've done here at the harris center is we've made uh something called snake hotels which are these devices sort of stacked wood pallets with sort of a, a, an insulated cloth over top and there's some research out of Vermont and sort of Jim Andrews uh, herpetological group over there that shows that they often need um, break points. And there's the thought that these sort of snake hotels or snake cover boards can provide some um, waypoints for these snakes uh, as they're sort of moving between habitats during the, the breeding season and moving between their summer and wintering grounds. So they just went in. I don't have any data to report, but it'll be interesting to see if some snakes do start to utilize them. Let's see, the next question, uh, will animals like bears move their hibernation locations during their awake periods or do they typically stay put? They stay put. They often don't even come out. They will wake up and they kind of roll around in their den. Um, they often relieve themselves. They kind of get up and go to the bathroom. Does that sound familiar? Um, so that's, all, but they don't get up, they won't rouse. So, you know, you shouldn't, a bear that you see walking around in the woods is a bear that's awake, not in, um, you know, ha isn't in the middle of its hibernation. So we are concerned that bears are waking up for good 
earlier and earlier in in the in the in the spring so that's something to watch out for a sort of you know average den emergence timing that seems to be um getting earlier in the season uh let's see tyler grade three is wondering how the weasel's fur is able to change from brown to white do they lose their fur and grow in new fur oh that's a great question like how it happens it happens really gradually they often <clears throat> it doesn't fall out and all grow in at once like um it's often you know very gradual so kind of like your own hair you never really notice that you have new hairs growing and old hairs falling out it's a lot like that um where you know that gene expression turns on and they get the sort of uh, a, a difference in their coat if anybody has a you know I, I have a canine at home i can't say as much for the felines but you probably notice the same thing in your dog where they get an increased uh number of hairs per square inch on their body in the winter you know as winter approaches and then the shed happens in the spring right as they sense the difference in temperature so it's a little bit like that like your dog's not ever bald. It's just kind of happening in, in gradual kind of waves. All right, let's see the next one. Are all animals from the Arctic white? No, I mean, a lot of most, a lot of terrestrial animals from the Arctic are. There's lots of uh, marine ones that aren't, but like Arctic fox, uh, polar bears, snowy owls uh there are nice examples of white arctic animals but then you also have like lemmings pika marmots organisms that aren't white um so the the white versus dark is not a hard and fast you know you don't have to be white to make it in the arctic but there's often a lot of advantages to being white because you blend in with the snow and you also have um, more insulation from your your hollow hairs or hollow feathers that can help sort of act as basically a big down sleeping bag. Uh, let's see, the next one, when would those Antarctica critters unfreeze? Oh yeah, that's a great question. They. On, they can, in Antarctica, they are very transient. They can spring to life and re-enter anhydro, anhydrobiosis or this persistent freeze tolerant state within a 24 hour period. So there are times of, of the Antarctic summer where temperatures get above freezing and actually liquid water flows from melt water from the glacier into these small uh, open water ponds and pools those are the times when the soil temperature is above freezing that they will uh, engage in sort of active parts of, of their life cycle including foraging and reproducing there's some evidence out there that antarctic nematodes might live hundreds of years but only act actually be active for a few number of days or weeks out of those hundreds of years so that's really fascinating to think about how you could have an organism that's ancient, but is really only been awake for a few days out of that, those centuries that it's been all, uh, technically alive. It really it brings up the, the question of what does it mean to be alive? Are you alive if you're ametabolic? I guess, as long as you can resurrect yourself. Very interesting. That is interesting. Um, I see we have one minute left, but there's a whole bunch of questions. How do you want to deal with that, Karen? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm trying to look at them here. I, I'll try to do them really quick. A ferret is related to a weasel. There are, um, it, it's, um, a ferret is a, we a type of weasel much a uh, one that's much more uh accustomed to warmer places um some questions about bears um 
they eat a lot, like a fantastic amount of calories going into their hibernation period. Um, that's why you have to be wary of like the bird feeders at that time of year. Um, and then I just want to say before we want to run out of time to like a lot of the teachers have asked questions. If you all want to just um, e email me your questions or maybe we could get, I could get them out of the chat and I'm happy to email you little uh, snippets to, to those so that you can, I don't want to leave these burning questions go unanswered. These are good questions. All right, so I will definitely, uh, if you if, if you're not in one of those groups, just um, write to me via my email and I'll be happy to write you back. I could talk about this stuff all day. I'd be happy to talk about it more with you. So sorry I couldn't get to all of them right now, but just follow up with me and I'll be happy to answer more. Yes, I can. I love all the questions, it's so great. I can send them to you. I, I'll have a copy of the chat and I can get those to you, Karen. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. It was so great, such great questions. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, thank job. You. Good job, Karen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>